it's all just happened so fast, it seems like. Freedom of speech seemed to be relatively intact pre... I don't know if I should say that word on the show anymore. It's hard like, to say that pre- word. Pre-pandemic. Pre-pandemic, that's the safer word. Pre-pandemic. Is this just going to get worse? I mean, where 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 does this go? Where are we headed? What can we do? It, it, it gets worse before it gets better, right? Yeah. So unfortunately, uh, again, these are not like, uh, these are easy concepts to grasp. If they want to maintain power, they must control the narrative. Yeah. Uh, but how can they control the narrative when we are able to communicate and right. communicate freely? Right. And the answer is they can't, mm. which is why I said this this uh, this version of government that we have, this form of government is no longer compatible. Mm-hmm. Um, and so they're going to stop that. Christine Lagarde, uh, f- formerly with the IMF and now head of the ECB, she said uh, a couple years ago, she said that, you know, innovation is a threat to financial stability. And she's right. It is. But the goal is not to stop the innovation. The goal is to tra- you know, transform and change along with it. And so unfortunately, you know, as they continue to lose their grip, they have to squeeze harder. Yeah. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the What Is Money Show. I am thrilled to have you here joining me on my mission to help shine light on the corruption of money. Now, if this is your first time listening to the What Is Money Show, I strongly recommend that you go back to episodes one through nine first, which lays a lot of the groundwork for many of the concepts that we explore on the show. These first nine episodes are my series with Michael Saylor and thousands of people have told me that this is the best podcast series they've ever heard hands down, and that it was instrumental to their understanding of money and Bitcoin. So if you're looking to start a deep dive into the nature of money, I don't think there's any place better that you can start other than episode one of this show. Now, a little bit about this show and how it makes money. The What Is Money show is 100% sponsor based. So all of our revenues are derived from direct sponsorships. And I strive to be very selective about the sponsors that I work with, specifically only using sponsors that I use personally, and also choosing sponsors that have values which are well aligned to the values expressed on this show, such as freedom, education, self-sovereignty, etc. So what I'm gonna do now is a few ad reads right at the top of the show, and then I'll do a few more ad reads in the middle. And I hope you'll take the time to listen to them, as again, these are hand-selected sponsors, and I think you'll like what they have to offer. Today's podcast is brought to you by In Wolf's Clothing. Wolf is the first startup accelerator dedicated exclusively to the Bitcoin Lightning Network. Four times per year, Wolf brings teams from around the world to New York City to work with like-minded entrepreneurs, pushing the boundaries of what's possible with Bitcoin and Lightning. The program is designed to help early stage companies achieve product market fit, develop their brand, secure early stage funding, and grow businesses that help fuel the global adoption of Bitcoin. So go to wolfnyc.com to learn more about the program or apply. Again, that's WolfNYC, W-O-L-F-N-Y-C dot com. Mark Moss, welcome to the What Is Money Show. Yeah, thanks, Robert. Pleasure. It's great to have you here. I yeah. think this is the first one we've done in person it is. on my show. Um, and we are sitting here in Miami yeah. on the eve of Bitcoin 2023. So lots to be excited about. Yeah. Um, just by way of quick intro, you probably don't need one. But here it is anyways. You are the host of the Mark Moss Show. And you're also the author of The Uncommunist Manifesto. That's right. Co-authored with Mr. Alex Svetsky. Yeah. Um, what's up, man? Dan? How you been? It's the first time we've sat down to do a show together. We've done some virtually, for sure. Um, you on my channel and me on yours as well. Um, but we've hung out a lot in yeah. person. You're yeah. one of my favorite people to talk about because there's so much fun stuff to always talk about. Thanks, so, man. Likewise. So uh, excited to be able to do this. Here at uh, Bitcoin, Bitcoin Miami. Should be a fun week. A lot to look forward to. Um, at a time when the world is freaking crazy. Yeah. Keep thinking that it's maybe not going to get much crazier, but it just new ways to get crazier keep coming up. Yeah. Um, and I know one of the things we talked about last time was your, is this a, a it's a framework really, it's right? Framework. These, these three Thesis. three cycles framework that yeah. you're talking about. Maybe you could we could talk about that. Just yeah. kind of reintroduce the framework and tell me what's going on in the world yeah. according to this. Yeah. So the super high level of that is just a framework to kind of look through history 
to see how we have cycles that mm -hmm. repeat. And uh, there's a lot of people who study cycles and there's uh, from lunar cycles and you know astrology and getting all that. Um, and there's cycles from seven years, 18 years, 80 years, 250 years, et cetera. Um, but I was looking at like three main cycles and I think um, to really understand the world to get context, you kind of have to look at um, multidisciplinary. That's kind of what Bitcoin is, mm -hmm. right? Multidisciplinary to kind of get better context of that. And so when I was when I was looking at these different cycles, it looked like there was like three forces in the world. And so um, change happens, typically kind of opposing forces and like a pendulum swinging back and forth. And so I like to think that problems create solutions or solutions to come to problems. So when you look back, we have the, what I've kind of identified as uh, three cycles and I look at it politically. So on a 250 year time frame. Mm -hmm. Now there's an 80 year cycle. So like uh, there's a couple 80 year cycles. So like the fourth turning is an 80 year cycle, obviously. Um, there's a, uh, a, a regime change cycle. So about every 80 years, it kind of fits into that same uh, fourth turning framework. If I look at it really like 84 years, um, three times 84 equals 252. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of when you get the the triple cycle. That's the big one, 250 mm -hmm. years. So 250 years ago was the American Revolution, the French Revolution. 250 years before that was the Protestant Reformation. Mm -hmm. And so we can kind of go back. So every 250 years, like there's this big political upheaving mm -hmm. where it seems like the world has rejected centralization and moved back to decentralization. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think it's human nature. We just take things too far. Yeah. And then we correct what we overcorrect. Right. We take that too far. Right, for sure. And then we correct and overcorrect. And so it's like this pendulum that swings back and forth. I, I kind of look at it like uh, if you were bowling with little kids and you put the bumpers up mm -hmm. and the ball just kind of mm -hmm. ping pongs back and forth, right? So about every 250 years, you kind of have this cycle. Um, of course, it doesn't change in a vacuum, but that's a political revolution cycle. So political ideology changes, the way that we govern ourselves changes. Um, but a lot of that is driven by technology, so about every 50 years, approximately, the contrative wave is 60 years. So on a 40 to 60 year, I call it a 50 year cycle, there's a technological revolution. Mm. And every time there's a new technology, it changes the way that we communicate, the way that we organize, mm. et cetera. And so a lot of that has to do with the way that we organize ourselves politically as well. Mm. And so we can see um, about 250 years ago was the start of the industrial revolution. Mm -hmm. And so for example, that brought us um, centralizing, brought us into cities and factories. Yep. Um, so there's that one. Uh, so about every 50 years we've had that and then we'll dig into that. And then the third one being the financial revolution cycle. And so then technology drives financial markets. Mm -hmm. So each financial or each technological revolution is driven a financial market. So uh, we've had five in the last 250 years, industrial revolution. We had um, steam engine and railways. We had electricity and steel. We had oil and automobiles. We had telecommunications, microprocessors, and now I think we're witnessing the, the next one. Mm. But you can see each financial market, each financial um, sector has been driven by that. So what's dominated the financial markets over the last 50 years? Telecommunications, mm. internet technology. Yeah. What was before that? Ford, GM, GE. What was before that? Uh, steel, oil. Right, right, right. right. And so all three of those, I think, work together. But what's interesting is they're on different cycles. So we have about a 250-year political revolution cycle, a 50-year technological revolution cycle, and an 80-year financial revolution cycle. Mm -hmm. But all three are converging right now. And I think that's the big thing, right? So it's like um, we're kind of uh, getting the, the double up or the triple up where they're all happening right now. So when you look at the, we're going through so much change right now, it's because all of that's changing mm. at the exact same time. Wow. So that's roughly every 250 years, then you get the confluence of all three Yep, that produces something, a radically new world. After a all radically new world. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So, you know, 80 years ago, we witnessed a financial revolution where the entire global financial system changed. Uh, the, the pound sterling was the reserve currency of the world. And then we had the Bretton Woods Agreement in 1944, where the dollar took over the reserve currency of the world. Right. right. Um, if you if you if you talk to any of the financial analysts, which I know you have extensively, um, you know, the last eighty years have been about the same. But you have to kind of go back to the forties to kind of see another uh, financial period like we've had uh, right now. Mm. And so, you know, Ray Dalio talks about it in his uh, you know credit cycles, yeah. business cycles, and so they operate in this like eighty year time frame. And so. Uh, we're witnessing all that falling apart. Mm -hmm. um, but ultimately, I think it's the it's the technological piece that I'm kind of the most interested in. I think yeah. it's driving the most change right now. Yeah, I agree. It's technology drives everything, really. I mean, it seems foundational uh, because it changes 
what we do for a living. It changes how we engage with the world and with one another. Yeah. And so it's kind of like the base layer of human action in a way. It's like that's what we spend most of our time doing is engaging with whatever the technological paradigm of the era is. Exactly. And you just think about how much these things have changed us. Like I know me personally, like psychologically, I feel this, I'm strangely addicted to Twitter. Yeah. You know, we're in this information society where ideas move so quickly and bank runs happen faster. There's like all these different implications of, of being in a new paradigm um, that are almost unimaginable yeah. before going into it. What and you, and you start to realize that the current form and structure of our political systems and our business systems are not compatible with where we're at technologically right. anymore. Yeah. And so there's like this mismatch. And so uh, we're going through this state change, mm -hmm. right? And if you were like in physics or whatever, when you're going from one state to another, right. there's this uh, disruptive pattern. It's not smooth. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. Like, uh, I think it's right before water freezes, right? The molecular activity goes through the roof. Yeah, and or then, any of the state changes. Yeah, matter. and then it collapses. Yeah. So it's like we're going through that tumultuous phase before things shift. Yeah, that's exactly right. And and we kind of go through these uh, these periods, like I said, because of, of human nature where we take things too far. And so we went from, you know, 250 years ago, the American Revolution, where we left the centralization of the monarch and we set up a decentralized government, mm -hmm. independent states, right. right? A small federal government, et cetera. Um, I'm not going to say that was that was too far, but now we've been trending back towards the centralization model. Yeah. And I think it's pretty easy for anyone to see. And uh, when I put out on Twitter, a lot of times I'll put out like this is a signpost of this, you know, pendulum swinging back right. is what I kind of call it. And a lot of times people are called BS on that. Right. Because mm -hmm. it's like, how can you say we're going back to decentralization? I would argue we've never been more centralized. Yes, that's the right, whole point. Right, right, right. And so, right. you know, with the World Economic Forum and the World Health Organization and the World Trade Organization and the yeah. UN and the IMF yeah. and et cetera, and if you if you want to look at you know the world through a geopolitical lens right now, I mean, it's it's globalism. It's it's it, what you might frame up with the Russia Ukraine situation is a war against globalism. Yeah, yeah. No, it's a great point. It's kind of that it tends to be darkest before the dawn thing, right? Because we were very centralized under the under the medieval church before the printing press sort of blew that out. Exactly. It became very decentralized again. That's where it feels like we're at with the nation state and, central and, and, and just and just to right. pull that back just a little further. So we had the Roman Empire, which was very centralized. Well, first it was a Roman Republic that was That's decentralized. Right. Yeah. And then the Roman Empire centralized all that. When the barbarians came in, it just blew all that apart and decentralized. It was the church that came in that started to centralize that back up because yeah. the whole world was you know uh, in disarray, mm -hmm. and so the church kind of brought order with chivalry and things like that. Yes. And they were the ones that started to rebuild the churches. I'm sorry, the the roads and the bridges and mm -hmm. things like that. Um, and it was a great movement, but then that went too far. That's right. And then it became centralized and too powerful and too much control. And then the printing press, to your point, blew that apart, decentralized it back to the cottage and farm industry. Yeah. And then the industrial revolution, another piece of technology, started bringing it back together yeah. again. Yeah. Yeah. There's a great book by Will Durant and. Oh man, the title escapes me, but he describes this very dynamic between centralization and decentralization. He calls it yeah. the systole and diastole of human history, which is like okay. the beating of a heart, essentially, okay. that we keep doing this as people. Yeah. And um, yeah, I hope that we're on the cusp of another decentralized revolution because things are definitely trending negatively right now. Yeah. Um, and without something like Bitcoin, I would be very pessimistic for where we are. I think uh, when you when also when you look at that, um, I think an interesting piece is like again going back to technology changing the way that we organize ourselves and the way that we communicate. And so uh, we went from this farm industry, farm and cottage industry, and then we started moving to these cities. And uh, you know, each nation kind of had their own little path towards industrialization. But like, let's take uh, the United States for example. We started moving into these uh, mass manufacturing, and it was really 1908 which is one of the technological revolutions. Henry Ford created the automobile, but he also created the mass production. Mm -hmm. And so we started bringing everybody into these factories to do this mass production assembly line. And so you have assembly line workers. Some people are smarter. Some people are not as smart. Some people are taller, stronger, whatever. But everybody was a cog on the wheel. Mm -hmm. and, th and that was great. It built this robust uh, middle class because now you had people who didn't know anything, had no motivation, but they could do the same work as smarter, more motivated people. So you create this robust middle class, but because of that, we had to create management systems to manage that. Mm -hmm. And so 
Uh, there was all types of management systems that were installed for this, you know, top-down central planning, mm-hmm. so that everybody could be a cog in a wheel. Everyone could be a one and a zero in that assembly line. Um, and in order to do that, as that continued to scale, we saw this mass production through automobiles and GE, et cetera. Um, it also created a, a, a government structure to manage it the same way. Right. And so, as we saw the industrial revolution grow, as we saw these mass uh, these mass uh, manufacturing operations grow, it changed the way government worked. Mm-hmm. So then government became very top-down, centrally controlled, and it started to build all these um, systems for people as well, the welfare state, mm-hmm. the healthcare state, yeah. um, the retirement, social security, social security all of that. Yeah. And so all of that started to grow this top-down yeah. management for the masses. And I think a lot of that goes back into why we also look at... Um, Keynesian economics, for example, also manages economics the same way. Yeah. So, you know, John Maynard Keynes was around the start of the century, you know, early 1900s, kind of creating this. Obviously, he was instrumental in the Bretton Woods Agreement in 1944. So he was kind of creating this financial system where we looked at everybody in this financial system as a one and a zero, Mm -hmm. taking out all the human element action of that. Um, and so all of that was kind of created to manage that old system, the, um, you know, the industrial age. Mm-hmm. And today we're in the information age. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's a great point that in that. So you're describing like the institutional realities that develop on top of a certain technological paradigm. And right now we're just undergoing this misfitness. Right. Because we have a new technological paradigm, but the institutional realities haven't caught up. And in fact, as you were saying offline, they're fighting to maintain their their viability, right? Through censorship and all these other things. That's exactly right. What um on the financial piece, you have your sovereign debt crisis. Yeah, isn't this kind of a symptom of fiat too? That we basically governments have a, a money printer. They have the legal monopoly on currency production. They've obviously abused that privilege to borrow cheaply and accumulate an excessive amount of debt. Yeah. Uh, is that going to be the defining financial crisis of our era, do you think? Is this the, I guess, the bankruptcy or defaulting of yeah. nation states? Certainly. Uh, we're you know we're at a point where, to your point, they have the money printer. And so when you have a money printer, you print. Yeah. Uh, when the whole world looks like a hammer or yeah. uh, when all you have is a hammer, the whole world looks like a nail, right? Yeah. And so when you have that money print, all you do is print. And so we're sort of at the end of that cycle, back to the Ray Dalio, long-term credit cycle, business cycle, et cetera. And so they've printed so much money. Um, with reckless abandon, really since you know the turn of the century, and Federal Reserve created 1913, Bank of England started before that, and really the gloves came off in 1971 when we tied, you know, broke the ties to the gold standard. Mm-hmm. But we've we've printed so much money, we have so much debt, and that debt just weighs us down. And unfortunately, when you're a debt-based monetary system, it's a Ponzi mm-hmm. scheme, and so you can't stop printing, right? Right, and so we constantly have to be expanding and, and growing. And so we're at this point that. Um, and John Maynard Keynes actually came up with this. It's called the Keynesian multiplier. Mm-hmm. And once you get, the, the goal is that you add debt to get growth, mm-hmm. right? So if I want to grow my business, I could take on debt to get a new truck. Mm-hmm. And if I, if that truck costs me 5,000 a month, but I can make 15,000 with the truck, right? So it allows me to grow. Mm-hmm. But the problem is at some point, the debt doesn't get me enough growth and it starts dragging me down. And, and John Maynard Keynes called that about 90%. The Keynesian right. multiplier. So once we get over 90%, we're not getting enough growth for that. You know, uh, there's been studies that have shown that once you get over 125% debt to GDP, then there's just no way out of it. That's right. Hyperinflation, and, right? And, and that's where the U.S. is. We're kind of at that 125% yeah. um, number. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, the Gold Investment Letter. The Gold Investment Letter helps sophisticated investors navigate capital markets and maximize their profits in trading gold, silver, and mining stocks. The Gold Investment Letter seeks out the most undervalued companies and identifies special situations in the mining sector, and then provides in-depth analysis on both their financial positions and future prospects. The Gold Investment Letter explores many complex domains, such as investor psychology, portfolio management, and macroeconomic trends, all with the goal of making you a better investor. The Gold Investment Letter offers a free version and a paid premium version And I strongly recommend you at least sign up for the free version because after having read a few of these issues, I can promise you it is a treasure trove of good information. You can sign up for the free newsletter today at goldinvestmentletter.com. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, iCoin Technology. iCoin has just released a sleek new hardware wallet. Looks like a mini iPhone, a little touch screen and camera on it. 
the device has no Wi-Fi, no cellular connection, no GPS. It's a strictly physically cold hardware wallet. Uh, like I said, it's got a high-res 3-inch touchscreen. It's got a camera for air gapping the wallet. Uh, it's got optional Bluetooth compatibility. And it's a really a, a brand new UI, UX experience for a hardware wallet, making it very accessible, easy to use, not intimidating. And as we always talk about on this show, the only way you can truly own your Bitcoin is by having it in self-custody. So you need a device like iCoin Wallet to truly own your Bitcoin. Go to iCoinTechnology.com today and use promo code BITCOIN23 for 30% off of this new sleek hardware wallet. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, CrowdHealth. CrowdHealth is a Bitcoin-enabled alternative to legacy health insurance. Now let's face it, legacy health insurance is an absolute scam. Nobody can explain this better than the legendary comedian, Chris Rock. This is insurance. You got to have some insurance. You got to, there's an insurance. They shouldn't even call it insurance. They should just call it in case shit. Man, I give a company some money in case shit happens. Now, if shit don't happen, shouldn't I get my money back? <laughs> so with CrowdHealth, instead of just paying premiums that you'll never see again, you can hold part of this pool of savings in dollars and in Bitcoin through CrowdHealth. And when you have a health event, you can draw against this pool of communal savings. So go to joincrowdhealth.com slash breedlove to learn more or sign up. Um, there's really three ways out of it. So uh, the first way out is either, you know, we, we have some sort of what, what happened back in the 40s is we have some high inflationary event. They call it financial repression. The IMF did a white paper on it in 2015. We saw it happen in Israel in the 80s. It happened in the US in the 40s. And you'd have massive inflation and you keep bond yields low. Mm -hmm. And so with massive inflation, you push the GDP up. Right. So you keep the debt levels down, but you push the GDP up. So the ratio yep. changes. Yep. So that's that, that's one way to do it. Um, yep. Another way to do it would be to, you know, default on the debt. Yeah. And that's the least likely option. Yep. And the third option is we just kind of muddle along mm -hmm. and we kind of sit in this stagflationary mm -hmm. period. Right. And those mm -hmm. are the options. But neither of those options are good. And I think um, when we look at um, when we, when we look at all three of these topics together, we see that these institutions that we have, they're no longer compatible. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think we can kind of break break a couple down, but I think this financial institution is the last piece to be broken down. Mm. And then all of that authority, the author, the yeah. authority gets broken for all that. Why finance is, why is finance last? Is it just because it's the slowest to adapt to new technologies and I guess it's where the most power is so the stranglehold is the strongest is that why it's so slow to adapt well when you look at what they are most of them are information pieces right mm -hmm. so obviously you have the military but even the military is irrelevant today and this kind of goes back to this conversation I had with uh, Dr. Robert Malone talking about the fifth generation of warfare mm -hmm. and so um, he got it from somebody else and I forget who he got it from and to, not to spend a lot of time on it but, but to kind of break that down what is what is the fifth generation of warfare well the first generation of warfare would be mano and mano mm -hmm. that's me and you let's just mm -hmm. duke it out right and the second generation of warfare was um i'm going to get an army and you're going to get an army mm -hmm. okay um that was organized battle the third generation of warfare was like heavy artillery that was airplanes um carriers things mm -hmm. like that and the u.s dominated in third generation mm -hmm. warfare fourth generation warfare was guerrilla warfare mm -hmm. which we really saw happen in vietnam right and it's also terrorism yeah asymmetric warfare asymmetric warfare and it should be noted that the united states has never won a war since fourth generation warfare hmm wow because aircraft carriers don't do you any good right when you're fighting an unseen unknown enemy yeah the other thing with an unseen, unknown enemy like the like like uh, terrorism that we fight today, it's decentralized. Mm -hmm. There's not a head to go kick, uh, you know, chop off yeah. of the snake. What um, all these decentralized cells share in common is ideology, mm -hmm. but not leadership. Right. So how do you defeat that? Yeah. And the answer is you don't. Mm -hmm. Fifth generation warfare, as we were discussing, is now a psychological warfare, where we we feel it. 
and we know it, but we don't know where it's coming from. We don't know who it is. We don't know why. This is the gaslighting. Mm -hmm. This is the lies. This is all of that. We know that we're being attacked, mm -hmm. but and we know it's psychological, but we don't know from where. Right. So it's more, much more like a psyop. It's that. a psyop. Yeah. It's a psyop. Yeah. And okay, so financial crisis of our era is a sovereign debt crisis. Those with the money printer have printed too much money, accumulated too much debt. The technological revolution, obviously, we've got Bitcoin, now got Noster as kind of this decentralized yeah. communication protocol. I, th I think we, for, the t for, the, for that, I think we want to go back to the internet because mm. I think that's the big turning point. And we, you know, these new technologies, they take decades before you start to realize the impact. And that's one of the things with Bitcoin is that um, I think most people, I'm sure you would agree, expect too much too soon. Mm. And they don't realize that these t these things take time to evolve and, yeah. and and time to change things. And it's the change that then, you know, build it on, this, on the shoulders of giants, right? Mm -hmm. And as those changes, then we can grow faster. And so they, they fail to realize that evolutionary process. So we look at the internet, um, really, you know, we might look at the mid 2000s. I mean, the iPhone came out in 2007. So that's when I see it really started taking off. The world started getting, you know, mm -hmm. smartphones and, and attached to the internet. And we can see how much has changed. And so Kind of like with economics, we'd say Keynesian economics fails because central planning fails because there's not enough information. Mm -hmm. Well, the internet has unleashed information. Mm -hmm. And what's happened is it's broken down institutions. And so just like the printing press um, back during, before the Protestant Reformation, you would only look at the church and they would tell you what the Bible said and they would tell you what their version was, but you couldn't read it for yourself. Mm -hmm. So we had this authority. The author would tell us that with their authority and there was all these um, sim symbolic, you know, all the symbiology behind that authoritarianism. So they would wear their certain costumes and they right. would have the cathedrals and all of that would build to the authority. But once we were able to read it for ourselves, it, it tore that down. Yeah. And the internet has basically done the same thing. Uh, when we were kids, I mean, you had, everyone listened to the same music. We all watched the same nightly news. There was one newspaper and I think it was like the New York Times is like, um, what was their slogan? Uh, Walter Cronkite was on nightly news and he would give his like news monologue and say, and that's all there is to know. Yeah. It's like, really? <laughs> like your five or six stories is everything yeah. in the world. Right. <laughs> and the internet has allowed us to all go off into our own paths and pursue our own interests and, and to pursue interests we didn't even know we had. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we all watch the same movie um, movies and we all listen to the same music, but today it's all, it's so super varied. We've yeah. been able to explore, but it's also, it's torn down those authority figures. So Walter Cronkite, uh, he had made, he had made some news program. I forget exactly what the topic was. And, um, some people came out and proved what he was saying was wrong. Mm. And he lost, I think they called it Cronkite gate mm. and he lost his authority. And like, once that was broken, it was over. And so no longer today, do we look at the New York times or the Washington mm. post or even CNN as, as authority figures, you know, YouTube has replaced the authority of TV. Mm. Right. The Joe Rogans have replaced the authority of the Tom Brokaw's and the Walter Cronkite's and the Barbara Walters or whatever, who we used, used to look at as authority figures. And even like with the medical system, the medical establishment, right, we used to look at these doctors, but even that's been broken down. And it's partly because the wisdom of the crowd is too is too right. great. And within, you know, some people might take this the wrong way. I think I've said this before. They didn't like it. But, you know, within about five or six hours, you could become about a 70% subject matter expert on most things. Yeah. Just jump in and, and watch it. And also you'll see, I, I see it all the time. I'll see someone on Twitter say something. I'm like, wow, that was really good. That was really insightful. I never thought about that. But then you read the comments. Hmm. Have you ever done that before? You read the comments and they're like, they're breaking that argument apart, showing different perspectives. And so it's that wisdom of the crowd. And so it's torn down all these authorities. And I think we've gotten to the point now where I just don't, central planning, central governments, the center, it can't ever hold. Mm. The fringe is too great. You have a thousand ideas on the fringe and it's always going to tear down the center. Mm. And so it's almost like the form of government we have today is no longer compatible. Yeah, no, it makes a lot of sense. And um, what we've become more of a peer-to-peer -peer world. So it makes sense that the top-down command and control institutions yeah. just don't map on to peer-to-peer -peer world. Right. Um, Bitcoin, Noster, AI, 
like yeah. supporting freedom. But AI is a bit ambivalent, I guess. Could seems like it could go either way, whether it's open source AI versus closed source AI. And that's gonna be the battleground that we're gonna be fighting. Right. So where do you see like the one view I guess I have on AI is that it's gonna be a massive productivity enhancer. So you would expect there to be more economic surplus created from this thing. I'm not clear whether it's going to be open source AI that wins or closed source AI. What are your views on on this? That's going to be the battleground. And, and obviously, I think we both agree that we would hope that it would be open source AI that would win. Um, there's uh, Emod, and he's run that stable diffusion, and that's sort of like this open source decentralized uh, AI. He, I've, I've listened to him on some podcasts, and he says how um, he believes this tool is way too powerful and important for it to be controlled by a few mm-hmm. people. And so he wants to decentralize and give it to the world. And you could basically take these uh, models and uh, he has like his uh, his uh, graphics model that you can, I think, put down into like 1.6 gigabyte file and run on your own phone or your own computer and have my own version of AI instead mm-hmm. of somebody else's. Um, so hopefully that takes off. But as far as right now, the current AIs that we have, it's it's a little scary how centralized it is because especially if we get to the point where we start kind of outsourcing our thinking to these AI models, because then who's feeding the model? Right. And I'm sure most of your listeners have, have seen people running tests, you know, asking certain oh, questions yeah, right. to these AI and seeing how biased the answers are. Yeah. Um, it's pretty bad. So I think, I think it, it, it could be very dangerous and all technology is, mm-hmm. is potentially dangerous. Right. And so I think, I think that's interesting. I don't know, and 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 I mean, you might have other guests that are probably more subject matter experts than, than me on this, but it was a conversation I had this morning with James Lavish, who I know has been on your show. Um, the whole world's afraid of losing all these jobs to AI, mm-hmm. and you said you think it would be a productivity enhancer. Yeah. And that, that's kind of how I view it. I think it's a productivity enhancer. Um, the, va- the, the quality of our life seems to come down to the questions that we ask. Mm-hmm. Most people don't know how to ask good questions. Mm. And you ask an AI a stupid question, you're going to get back a stupid answer. Yeah, that's so true. Yeah, the number one, I haven't used ChatGPT that much, but um, one of my colleagues and one of his friends are really into it. And it's all about the quality of the question. Mm-hmm. Like how well can you prompt ChatGPT? Prompt. Is the, it is the sole determinant, I think, of the quality of the answer that you get. Yeah. Um, so for example, I could say, um, hey, ChatGPT, uh, do you build me the best investment portfolio. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> and, and, and it can't return that. Yeah. But if I could say, um, what types of assets would be the best during a time of high inflation, yeah. low economic growth, yeah. financial repression, and this time while uh, supply chains are breaking down? Now I'm giving it a very specific question to right. give me a specific answer, but I would have to know that information in order to ask That's right. it. And so... Uh, I think it can it can certainly enhance to your point, um, and of course, like creative destruction does, it'll get rid of some jobs, but it also creates new jobs. I've heard these prompt creators are getting hundreds of thousands of dollars now to go wow. go create prompts because that's a skill. Yeah, but that job wasn't available. Before. Right, right. So those jobs are being lost. Jobs are being created. Yes. Yeah, and that's that's a great point. It's anytime you're increasing productivity, you're destroying some jobs. Right. There's some job that a human's doing that a tool now does better. Yeah. That's the productivity enhancement. But it also creates new jobs. Yeah. So think about the Industrial Revolution. They created a machine that could do the work of 5,000 men. Mm-hmm. But what did the 5,000 men do? Turns out it was science and medicine. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> like, turns out we needed that. Yeah. Yeah. And there's always higher value aims to pursue. And it's we, we got to get past this fear of innovation because it doesn't make any sense. If an innovation is successful in the market, it's by definition good. Right. It's increasing productivity it's solving a problem better, faster, cheaper. Otherwise, it would not have succeeded. Yeah. Now, if it puts you out of a job, that just means you've got the wrong skills for the current technological paradigm. Yeah. And but that goes back to the system that we have is no longer compatible. Right. And so what they want to do now, and again, this system of management, top-down uh, management that we have today, was built off the Industrial Revolution. And so that's what created this Social Security, the welfare state, yeah. all of those. But now moving into this new age, that's not going to be compatible anymore. Yeah. And so to your point... Hey, if I lost my job, then I should go learn a new skill to put into the marketplace. Yeah. But now they want to start doing UBI because AI is going to replace jobs. And so let's just pay people not to work then. Yeah. Which which is certainly the wrong way. And, you know, I've often thought 
on the freedom aspect, if you took like a lion, a lion that lives on on the pride, it's the king of the jungle. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not safe. That lion has to fight other lions. Right. It could be killed by hunters. Yeah. It may not eat, et cetera. So I could go stick it in a cage and I could give it its one meal a day and I could pump it full of antibiotics. And now it's safe, but it's not free. And like that's the mm-hmm. contrast there. The problem with an animal is, a, is, a, is an animal born in captivity, that lion born in the cage, you can't go put that lion back into nature. Right. But we're not animals. We're humans. Yeah. And uh, I didn't like to eat vegetables when I was a kid. My dad would tell my mom, if he's hungry enough, he'll eat. Right. And as humans, if we're hungry enough, we'll eat. Yeah. And so um, people can learn new skills. Absolutely. And, and they have the motivation to do that if, if they need to. And to your point earlier, you can become a subject matter expert on almost anything in a few hours now with all the informational tools that are available to us. So not only is innovation proceeding more rapidly than ever, displacing more jobs potentially than ever, but you can adapt more quickly by using these tools. So I don't, there's just nothing to fear. Like if you're scared about your job or your industry being wiped out, I mean, you have to, I guess you have to understand the broader benefit of this thing succeeding, whatever that thing is, whatever the innovation is, it's serving, the success of it is a signal that it is serving people's best interest. Yeah. So if you were the collateral damage in that, well, that's on you. You now need to adapt or die. Yeah. It sounds harsh, but it is what it is. And, and you know, big problems create big opportunities. And so while you may view this as a big problem, like, oh my gosh, it's going to wipe out my job. It's also a big opportunity. Yeah. You could go jump into this thing right now. Yeah. And you could become one of the subject matter experts. Right. This could be the biggest opportunity of your life Mm -hmm. if you wanted to view it that way. Yeah. Yeah. And you've got to take the risk, right? Otherwise you're not going to reap the reward. Let's talk about this crisis of authority. I I liked your framing on this. Um, I, authority is such, it's a word that I don't really like. I do like these, the relation with the word author though. Yeah. And that if you are self-sovereign or you, you are, let's say self-sovereign, you're someone that tries to author your own life, which is to say you don't submit to two other authorities. And the paradigm that we're moving out of seemed to be one in which authority was central, right? It tended to be central authorities that imposed their will or their views or ideologies onto others. Again, I think this has to do with the technological paradigm. When my mom was growing up, she said we had channels three, nine, and 12. Yeah. And if the president was on, you're fucked. Yeah. So it's like, of course you didn't get, you're, you're getting authored basically or programmed from one central channel. Whereas now in the internet age, we have this, you know, infinite kleidoscope of possible informational channels. So what is this, how do you, what is this crisis crisis of authority that we're going through? It's, um, the authority was built up, um, because of the knowledge that they had. So they went to medical school, they read all the medical books, they were the experts in medicine. I don't have access to any of that information. Mm -hmm. So I have to just go trust my doctor. I have to trust that authority figure. Um, the whether that's economics or medical, mm-hmm. you know, professors at universities, um, the priests, etc. But what the crisis of authority is, in my opinion, is it's highlighted the gaps of knowledge. Mm. So what we've clearly seen is the emperor's wearing no clothes. What we clearly see is these authority figures who have built up to this level, whether that be in university or medical profession, economics, etc., there's massive gaps in their knowledge. They are not the authority we thought they are. And as a right. matter of fact, the crowd is way smarter. Right. So go, going back to this kind of Twitter post, right? So like, you know, uh, Paul Krugman's going to come out and, and make a statement about the the economy or, you know, Fauci's going to tell us about the medical. And like, he's going to be quickly disproven by a million people. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so uh, as we've started to see that, see these gaps, um, that's the crisis of authority. There's no way to maintain that anymore because it's not possible. Mm. It, they're just not smarter. It just, it, it will never work. Yeah. So that's kind of how I had framed it up. Are we then moving because we still need to trust experts. I, I hate, hesitate to say that, but we can't, all of us can't know everything. Is right? it experts or is it specialists? Specialists, probably a better word. But, but I think there's a key distinction, right? Because, um, A doctor pretends to be, well, not all doctors, but uh, one of these authority figures, right, would pretend to be the expert, like Fauci. Mm. I'm the expert. Right. Do you know everything? Mm. Or could you just say you're a specialist in this one area? Right. And the the key difference is, you know, if if my car 
is broken, do I need a car expert or do I need someone that can just rebuild my starter motor right? or just replace my tire? And so I think that's a different specialist. I think we're always going to need specialists, especially um, as the world gets more complex, mm -hmm. we need specialists. We need more specialists. But we're not outsourcing our thinking to the guru who's right. the expert. Instead, we're relying on specialists to help us. Right. And getting second opinions, right? Even if you go see a really good doctor and he's telling you you need some kind of surgery, it's always a good idea to get a second opinion. Yeah. So weighing specialist against specialist yeah. seems to be a useful way to get towards something that's true or useful. And and the reason why is the crisis in authority is because in order for the top-down central planners to maintain their grasp, they have to maintain authority. Mm -hmm. And so as these authority figures are being broken down, they lose their control. Mm. And so for us, we the people, it's not a big deal. This is a good thing. We want to have crowdsourced information. We want to have access to information faster and better. Mm. Um, we would rather crowdsource things. Uh, it's a crisis for them. Yeah. Because how do they maintain the authoritative grip? when they can no longer control the flow of information, when we no longer look at them as this smart expert, yeah. this technocratic you know, leader. Yeah. Yeah. It, I mean, it is a challenge to us individually, though, to take more responsibility for our own lives, right? You can't just defer your thinking or outsource your thinking to the experts, as you said. Yeah. You have to take the res which is what's true in life. Like you are responsible for your own life. The government is not here to save you. Social security is not here to save you. Like you, the individual are responsible for your actions and your decisions. So if anything, it does seem like we're moving hopefully to a more, a truer world. Yeah. Although it doesn't feel like that right now. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, Wasabi Wallet. With Wasabi Wallet, you can receive, send and store Bitcoin privately. In Wasabi Wallet, your transaction history and wallet balance are completely hidden. Wasabi Wallet is easy to use. All of its privacy features are built in by default, and it works with any amount of Bitcoin. Wasabi users can make CoinJoin transactions together with BTC Pay server users or Trezor Suite users. For BTC Pay server users, they can make payments directly inside of a CoinJoin. And for Trezor Suite users, you can make CoinJoins directly on a hardware wallet. These features result in the fee savings and security improvements for both sets of users. So go to wasabiwallet.io today to download the state-of-the-art Bitcoin privacy wallet. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, Casa. Casa makes it simple to buy and secure your Bitcoin without wondering whether you're doing it right. Specifically, Casa provides a multi-key custody solution, which is by far the most secure way to custody your Bitcoin. Now, when I talk about Bitcoin being theft-proof money or inviolable private property, a multi-key custody model is exactly what I am talking about. Using multiple keys lets you maintain full control of your Bitcoin while also giving you redundancy in case you lose one of the keys. It's also the best way to secure your Bitcoin for inheritance planning purposes. So go to keys.casa, that's C-A-S-A, -A, today to sign up and use discount code BREEDLOVE. Well, back to this pendulum, and I think we discussed this idea uh, when we talked about the book, The Uncommonist Manifesto, and I kind of talked about, I think, like this blow-off top of socialism. Mm -hmm. And so uh, when you look at financial markets, you have these blow-off tops. And basically the reason why you get these blow-off tops in financial markets is because markets stop going up when they run out of buyers, when there's no more buyers. Yeah. So when you've sucked everybody in that's available to buy, it gains momentum. So 2017 Bitcoin, for example, yeah. was running, 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 running. But in 2017, not a lot of people had known about Bitcoin. Yeah. And so eventually you bought, you got all the buyers that were there. You get this volatility at the top, bing, 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 bing. Yeah. And then it blows off. Right. And then those people that you attracted at the very top, they didn't really come in strong ideologically. Right. They just thought, hey, number go up, right? Yeah. And so then they're, they're the first to sell off, which means it equally moves down as fast. So you got, that's what creates these blow off tops. Um, and I think we're sort of in the same place with uh, socialism or central planning, if you will, as well, where to the point that you just made, we've outsourced all of our thinking. Hey, take care of my education. Mm -hmm. Take care of my kids. Mm -hmm. Take care of my retirement. Take care of my health. Just take care Take care of my security. T just take care of everything. Mm -hmm. What else can we give to them? Yeah. Yeah. It's um, the authority thing is, is strange to me. I guess 
may, there's comfort in authority. Is that why people tend to seek it out? Because you, you're trying to offload that responsibility of thinking or figuring it out for yourself. I mean, certainly that, uh, I think most of us, it's convenience. Yeah. It seems like most of the trade-off in life comes from convenience. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. That's why Bitcoin's scary for a lot of people. Right? We're willing to trade our, our safety, our security, our freedom mm -hmm. for convenience. I mean, both of us have iPhones in our hands. Yeah, well, it's pretty damn convenient. <laughs> <laughs> we know we know what we're trading off for the convenience, but we still we still make that switch, you know. And so as as this continues, as this new technology creates these tools, the authority figures, the central planners are losing their grip. Mm -hmm. We've exposed them. They want to tell us that uh, you know people in France, um, it's 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 all peaceful, right? Everything's good. Macron's got to figure it out with the retirement thing. But yet we can go on Twitter and we can see videos of right. millions of people in the streets marching. Right. Right. They can tell us, you know, what's going on with, with the Russia Ukraine thing, but then we can get on other news sources and we can get uh, other information. Mm. And so there's no way for them to maintain authority over any of these things right. as this technology has now given us this, uh, this freedom, if yeah. you will. And so that's the battleground and it's happening, uh, in all areas in regards to maintaining that grasp of power. Mm -hmm. And it really comes down to one thing and that's censorship. So mm -hmm. how do they stop it? Just like they did in the press and reformation or the printing press is kill you, call yeah. you a heretic and just kill you. And so I think that that's the battleground. And in my opinion, I, I did a radio show on it, I think two weeks ago. And I said, this is the single most important issue of our lifetime right now. Um, and it's censorship and it's censorship in movement. So you hear about them building these 15 minute cities all over. Yep. I did this video last week talking about um, the hidden danger of electric vehicles. Mm -hmm. And uh, without going too far on a tangent here, um, electric vehicles, you know, by 2030 and by 2035, depending on where you're in the world, they've mandated a complete switch from combustible engines to EVs. Mm. That That's impossible. Mm -hmm. Like we don't have enough minerals in the world to make mm -hmm. that happen. The cost would be so exorbitant. As a matter of fact, the average EV vehicle last year is $66,000. Most people can't afford a $66,000 mm -hmm. car. Ford lost forty-four thousand dollars on every EV vehicle it made. It made ten billion in profit on their um, SUVs and trucks, and it lost three billion on their EVs. Mm. How does that work? It doesn't. Right. It doesn't. The point is, not everybody has cars. Yeah. So they want to censor our movement. Hey, let's just control the movement. They want to censor our communication, um, and so obviously the Twitter files and you know the FBI working with these different platforms, Facebook, etc. Um, and so then they censor our communication and then they want to censor our money. Yeah. So then they have, you know, FinCEN and FTAF, the, the travel rule, and they have KYC and AML, SWIFT system, all these things to censor all of those types of transactions. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, as they continue to lose the grip, they have to squeeze harder. But the more they squeeze, the more we push back. So they squeeze harder. Right, right, back. right, right. But technology is advancing to a point. And I think they've realized that they are at a point where they can't control it anymore. So I think through the old internet, not to use a crypto buzzword, but whatever, if you want to call it Web 2.0, mm -hmm. like they could, they could exert power and squeeze and they could force censorship. Mm -hmm. But in this new paradigm of open monetary networks like Bitcoin, open communication networks like Noster, mm -hmm. it's, it will be impossible for them to control that. Right. Yeah, there's... Um we got a guest here. There's a, old, it reminds me of this old, this may have been in the Sovereign Individual or from another book that was related to it. When the printing press started to become popular, the church eventually saw it as like a threat, right? Yeah. It's like it was breaking its monopoly on knowledge, its monopoly on book production. And so the church started to vilify the printing press, trying to censor it, stop it, you know, destroying printing presses, et cetera. And what happened? Well, people started to print a lot more books about how to build printing presses. Yeah. So it's like when you try to, the moral story is when you try to censor or squash these technologies, it actually causes them to be employed in a mo the most subversive way possible. So it actually, it's a self-defeating effort, right? I think yeah. the more YouTube, et cetera, platforms, censors, creators, or free speakers the more these people are just going to move to other platforms and the more attention and eyeballs are going to move to those platforms. Yeah. And so it, it's always, it never works. Censorship in the long run, I think always destroys the censor rather than the censored. And there's a, um, there, you know, there's a dilemma that governments have. 
So the dilemma is that we need growth and progress. Mm -hmm. We need tax revenue, right. right? We need our people to be happy and grow. So we need them to have these technologies. But if I give them these technologies, then most likely they'll continue it to get rid of me. Undermines my authority. It yeah. undermines my authority. And yeah. so we're stuck in this. We can be North Korea, yeah. but look where North Korea is in the right. world. Or we can be, and, right, and so they're, they're, they're stuck in this dilemma. Um, to your point though, yeah, censorship is nothing new, uh, you know, and we saw it in the Roman Empire 400 years, you know, before Christ. Socrates had to drink poison because right. he was poisoning the minds of these of these kids. Yeah. And so we've always had censorship. Um, yeah, but it doesn't work. And I think just like what happened with Socrates being forced to drink poison, just like what happened in the Protestant Reformation and the book burning and, and labeling them heretics and killing them, I'm afraid we're at that same juncture today. Yeah. And uh, what do I mean by that? I mean, we literally killed Alex Jones, not not literally, but we've wiped him off the face of the earth. Mm -hmm. You can't even find him in a Google search. Wow, really? Yeah. I didn't know that. Now, he's alive and well on his own website, Yeah, but that's a problem. Yeah. So wait a minute. We can't, we can't get rid of him. We've done everything. Mm -hmm. We can't get rid of him. He's still bigger than ever on his own personal website. Wow. And so now using Bitcoin, using um, Noster, you know, using your own website, et cetera, how can, if I'm the government, if I'm the authoritarian, how do we control this? And the answer is, well, we'll just kill you. And yeah. not, not, not literally, but the United Cancel States you. just passed a restrict act yeah. that says if you use a piece of technology that they don't approve of, 20 years in prison, crazy, a loss of all your property, and up to a million dollar fine. Now, China doesn't even have that restrict. You don't even get that for second degree murder. But yet, if you use a sanctioned piece of technology, now, what would those sanctioned technologies be? Well, whatever they want them to be, of sure. course. But of course, it will be the, the platforms they can't control. Of right. course, cryptocurrency platforms, mixers, yeah. Bitcoin, yeah. and potentially, you know, decentralized platform, potentially a Noster type platform, right. a Telegram signal, something like that. Which is, it doesn't reconcile with the freedom of speech. Because at the end of the day, if you're running software, you're literally just telling a machine to run a That's set the point of code there is no freedom of speech anymore but, uh, but that i can't believe because you hear people talk about this restri restrict act and they typically just call it the tiktok bill yeah and they think oh they're trying to get tiktok out of the u.s due to some china relations issue because china's stealing our data yeah but as if china doesn't already buy that data if that were the case then it would be called the fucking tiktok bill and it would just be geared at tiktok but yeah. to your point it's it's this very Orwellian dystopian thing where you can I can tell you what software you can and can't run. That's equivalent to saying I can tell you what words you can and cannot speak. And obviously we have some version of that on the internet today. And there's 25 high ranking members of the government signed onto that bipartisan, more Republicans than Democrats, by mm -hmm. the way. Um, and so it's not just some little crackbuck bill. The G7, the top seven countries in the world all have um, censorship um, bills into place. Um, the UK, Ireland, the EU actually have bills where they're literally putting people into prison. I think Ireland has a bill. If they find something on one of your devices that could be used, could, pre-crime, could be used um, to uh, cause dissent in the government is punishable by five years in prison. Now, how did that, how did that get on your device? You know, uh, you know, I know like on WhatsApp, if someone sends me an image, it automatically like downloads it to my photos, mm -hmm. for example. Like, right. how did that even get on my thing? And it's, right. it's, it's, it's pre-crime. Now, it was sold to us, of course, for our protection. Of course. Of and course. What was this? Um, and originally it was sold to us to protect the democracy. Then it was like a national security issue. And now it's being sold to us to protect me. So the, the public didn't buy it mm -hmm. when it was for national security. Mm -hmm. uh, but now it's to protect us from from hate speech because people may say mean things to us. So well, we need to restrict that. Well. Couldn't anything be used to sow dissent? Like that is such an open-ended law. You could say a text That's message app could be used to sow dissent, right? That's the point. So I mean, it's, it's these the, these blank checks that are being written legislatively for governments to expand their powers that are- So they can arbitrarily impose them. So they yes. can impose them against their opponents right? and not for the people they want. So uh, for example, in the uh, Elon Musk took over Twitter mm. and he says it's doing it for a free speech. Apparently that seems to be what the case. So I applaud him on that. Mm. And there's a lot of other questionable stuff that we could talk sure. about. Sure. But uh, 
Apparently that's the case. He opened up the Twitter files and released those files to Michael Schellenberger, Matt Taibbi, mm-hmm. um, and um, they got pulled in front of a committee, a congressional mm-hmm. committee. And the FTC was going after Elon Musk. How dare you give these documents out? Um, and they were grilling these two, right? And as they're grilling them in Washington, the IRS goes and raids Matt Taibbi's house. Wow. And then they had an MSNBC reporter, Medi something, I forget her name now, run a piece, a hit piece, saying that uh, she had debunked all that information and all that information that they talked about was false. Mm -hmm. Then they pulled them back in front of the committee and said, hey, you lied to us. She said all that was bunk, was lies. Now you're facing five years in prison. Well, well, luckily the power of the crowd instantly went out and discredited everything that she had said mm-hmm. and backed it up. But this is the fight that we're in right wow. now. Wow. Man, how did we... It's all just happened so fast, it seems like. Freedom of speech seemed to be relatively intact pre... I don't know if I should say that word on the yeah. show anymore. It's hard like, to say that pre- word. Pre-pandemic. Pre-pandemic. That's the safer word. Pre-pandemic. Is this just going to get worse? I mean, where 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 does this go? Where are we headed? What can we do? It, it, it gets worse before it gets better, right? Yeah. So unfortunately, uh, again, these are not like, uh, these are easy concepts to grasp. If they want to maintain power, they must control the narrative. Yeah. Uh, but how can they control the narrative when we are able to communicate and right. communicate freely? Right. And the answer is they can't, mm. which is why I said this, this, uh, this version of government that we have, this form of government is no longer compatible. Mm-hmm. Um, and so they're going to stop that. Christine Lagarde, uh, f- formerly with the IMF and now head of the ECB, she said uh, a couple of years ago, she said that, you know, innovation is a threat to financial stability. And she's right. It is. But the goal is not to stop the innovation. The goal is to tra- you know, transform and change along with it. And so unfortunately, you know, as they continue to lose their grip, they have to squeeze harder. Yeah. Um, and that's where we're at. And I think I think we're at a juncture here. So back to the three cycles. So it sort of gives us this time frame. Mm-hmm. Now, we have to think it's like a pendulum. So um, as the pendulum swings up, it takes time. So at that top part, um, that, you know, it's a long period of time. Mm-hmm. And so um, they're not like on this date at this time, this is when the world changes. Sure. Uh, but we're witnessing that now. And I think this decade, the, you know, in the, by 2030, we're going to see most of this come to a head. And I think... You know, probably in the next four to five years, uh, this this really plays out, and we kind of have a, a choice a choice to make. Um, Jeremy, behind the scenes over there, uh, one of the first shows I did with him and Peter McCormick, we framed up the battle for the fate of humanity. Mm, yeah, and that, that. that that's kind of what I had framed up, which was uh, we're kind of coming to this pivotal point where um, if they get this social credit score, central bank digital currency, you know, uh, health passport check checkpoint system in. It may be really hard to get out of that. Yeah. Because history is just a cycle of uh, revolution, freedom, then oppression, mm-hmm. and then finally oppression, a revolution of uh, freedom, oppression. Um, and if they get that system put in, could they prevent another revolution from ever happening? And it's not just the censorship, because to the point that you've, you've made or we've discussed, censorship just doesn't work and it ultimately fails. Mm-hmm. Um, but could they get us to a point where there's not as much censorship? by using AI and social media to just kind of train us. Right, right. And The psyops do work. The psyops, right? And so from a young age, they're just kind of training us up in that way. Anybody that tries to cause dissent, they can nip it in the bud before it ever grows. And we could get into this perfect matrix type world. Um, Obviously, my hope is that we don't. I hope that, I believe that open monetary networks like Bitcoin, open communication networks like Noster, or other technologies that we built around that um, will prevent that from happening, and hopefully we can we can defeat Goliath there. Yeah, that's very like the process you just described there. It's very it parallels domestication of animals very closely. I had Lowry here the other day, yeah. and he was just describing that's basically what you do with a wild animal, right? You catch them in a cage, you breed them. The ones that are extra, the ones that are not docile, you kill. The ones that are docile, you keep breeding, and you do that enough generations before you know it. The animal is conditioned to be completely docile and, and subservient. So it's a weird thing that the state seems to try and do that to human beings. Um, okay, we every time you and I get together and talk, it's like there's all these things happening that we wish could be better. Like I, I don't enjoy sitting here talking about all the bad things happening, but yeah. there's just been a lot of them the past few years. Yeah, Maybe we could end on a high note. Yeah. 
Um, we are here in Miami, beautiful Miami for Bitcoin 2023. Yeah. What have you got going on for the conference? Yeah. What are you going to be doing? Certainly a high note, and, 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 and I appreciate that transition because while that does seem scary and doom and gloom, I'm full of hope and optimism. Yeah. Uh, I, I came across this quote the other day that I'm trying to commit to memory I've been saying, but Thomas Paine, one of our founding fathers, he said, if there must be trouble, let it be in my day mm -hmm. so that my kids may know peace. Mm -hmm. So you know what? Love I'm that. equipped for this. I'm ready for this. We'll handle this. And I do believe there's massive hope and prosperity on the other side. Uh, generations before us have gone through changes and trials and tribulations, and and the world goes on. The world doesn't end. Um, I believe in the human spirit. I believe in uh, I believe in uh, you know the drive for freedom and yeah. innovation. And I don't think that can be extinguished. Uh, we know central planning fails, and so uh, while it's scary and it's interesting, um, I'm, not, I'm not. I don't live in fear. So first of all, let's just say that. Uh, yeah. So it's dark. It's scary. We should know about it so we can do something about it. But but we don't need to be driven by fear. Um, I see massive hope and prosperity on the other side. These technologies that we're talking about it are going to create this this world. Um, as far as as far as at this event, uh, it, what a what a cool event coming together. Mm -hmm. um, it was really uh, Miami two years ago that it really hit me. I think there was I don't know ten or twelve thousand people at that event, and I just felt like this like electricity in the air, and uh, it's that vibration, mm. the vibe, right, mm -hmm. and. Uh, you know, what we're being told today is that we align on interests, preference, gender, sex, mm. race, whatever, but that's all a lie. We align on values. Mm. And then the higher those values are, the stronger that attraction is. Yeah. And so you get all these these Bitcoiners here. And, and what are Bitcoiners? Mm. They're free thinkers, out of the box thinkers, they're freedom maximalists. Mm -hmm. um, they're people searching for truth. Mm -hmm. Those are high values. They're yeah. people looking to better their lives, right? These are these are these are high values, and so to get these people together, uh, it's an amazing feeling. So I'm really looking forward to just that whole week. Um, speaking at the Thank God for Bitcoin event, which you helped spawn yeah. uh, the book. Which shout out to that. If you haven't read that book, you certainly should. I, it's one of the few books, uh, Bitcoin books that I've bought a bunch of and just gifted. Oh, thank you. Uh, it's an amazing book. Mm -hmm. And so speaking at that uh, today and tomorrow, and uh, what a cool what a cool event to really think about money from that paradigm. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, yeah, at the event, um, I'm going to be on stage both days. I'm going to work the news desk for a couple hours, which is going nice. to be super fun. That was fun last year. Yeah, yeah. that was super fun last year. A um, lot, lot of get-togethers and, um, you know, just kind of a time to just get together with a group of people like this, just share these ideas. And again, it's not about fear. It's about leaving here with, with hope. Yeah. And, and a plan. Yeah. I love that quote you shared from Thomas Paine. Um, I'm, I might use that on my keynote, but I'll, I'll be sure to throw you some credit. You should. Um, and yeah, the idea of people, this is why I love hanging out with Bitcoiners because you, there's no small talk really. It's like once you know someone's a Bitcoiner, people just, you know, you're aligned values yeah. wise, ethically, morally, intellectually in many ways. Yeah. And so people are just automatically friends. Like you, you just you're at this level of connection that you don't get with with people that you just typically meet that quickly. Yeah. And man, it creates a lot of energy, right? When you get that many people pointed the same direction. Yeah. They're all super smart, but but Bitcoiners come from all different walks of life. So the yeah. conversation is always flowing. It's always very stimulating. I I just have such a good time hanging out with Bitcoiners, and it's yeah. it's. You would not get that, I think, if you just observe Bitcoin Twitter from far away, because Bitcoin Twitter makes Bitcoiners look like a bunch of antagonistic assholes. Yeah. But then you get them in person, and it's like a love fest. Yeah. And so I always encourage people to, to come and check out these events because they, I, I genuinely look forward to them as like one of the highlights of my year. Yeah, for sure. So, yeah, dude, thank you for coming. My pleasure. Uh, I love hanging out. Yeah, great to talk to you as always. Uh, where can people find you on the internet? Yeah, so uh, onemarkmoss.com. Uh, everything's linked there. Uh, YouTube is my main outlet, so I make uh, a couple of videos a week on YouTube talking mostly about Bitcoin, macro, geopolitics, freedom, um, and uh, weekly on the iHeartRadio music stations and uh, too much on Twitter. I've been trying to fix that. <laughs> not not use Twitter as much, uh, but uh, on Twitter a lot as well, One Mark Moss. Awesome, dude. Thank you for doing this. Thanks.